Uh, first to uh, Job chapter 38. This is where uh, God begins to speak out of the whirlwind to Job. Job 38 at verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its, dark, its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. When I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors. When I said, this far you may come, but no farther. And here your proud waves must stop. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? That it might take hold of the ends of the earth and that the wicked might be shaken out of it. It takes on form like clay under a seal and it stands out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and the upraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And darkness, where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, that you may know the paths to its home. Do you know it because you were born then or because the number of your days is great? We'll stop there and then turn to Genesis chapter 1. And we'll just read verses 9 through 13. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Now sends our reading. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, again, having read your holy and infallible word, a word inspired and come, which has come straight from you. But yet it is a word, Lord, that is, uh, has such depth and is so profound that we need the eyes of the Holy Spirit that we need to have our eyes open. Father, I pray that you'd give, that you'd be with my mouth, that you would bless my words, that you would guide my thoughts as I speak, that you would bring forth exactly the word it is that you desire, and that you would be with each heart here, that your spirit would be working in each heart to encourage, to strengthen, to assure, to bless, and for those who have not yet known you as Lord and Savior, Father, we pray that you'd soften their hearts and turn them, that they might know that today is the day of salvation. Lord, all these things we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? This is the, this is the first question that, that God really begins to question, when he begins to question Job, this is the first thing that he says. And for the next two chapters, one of the, very interesting that, that you know, we, we know a little bit of the story of Job, and that's why I kind of started out with that, but Job's whole life has been destroyed. 
Everything that he has, everything that he owns, it's either been stolen, it's been destroyed, all of his children have died, and he himself is, is afflicted with boils and fevers, and so altogether his state is entirely miserable, and so the whole idea of the book of Job is they're trying to work out what's going on. So Job's friends are trying to help him, and for them it's very simple, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, therefore... You must have sinned against God. You have committed iniquity, etc. And, and his friends are actually know enough of the gospel. They know enough of the word somehow of, of God that if he repents, God will forgive. God is merciful. But Job knows that he's been upright. Job knows that there's no secret hidden thing. So he doesn't know and he doesn't understand because he knows that there's no particular thing that in his life that God is hammering at him for. So, but in his pain and in his affliction, he begins to wonder, you know, and, and, I, and I think really, the more that I've kind of read the book of Job over the years, and the more, the more I, I think what it really is, is that it's not that Job is saying God has made a mistake, but it's almost as if, you know, that somehow God's view, I've been out of his view for a, a, enough time, or there, there's something that's happening here that God hasn't seen. In some way, I've been left unprotected or, or something to that effect. And, and, and so his, his discussion or his argument is, is some way that there's a mistake that's been made. And, and so now God begins to speak in, in, in Job 38. And, in, and for the next two chapters, Job 38 and 39, God speaks. And he speaks of one thing. He speaks of creation. He speaks of the power of his work in creation. And he'll, he'll give, and then Job will speak again, and then he'll speak some more. And, and again, he doesn't speak of sin. He doesn't speak of total depravity. He, he doesn't speak of man's fallenness. He doesn't speak of judgment. He speaks only of his work in creation. So why? And, and, and brothers and sisters, I, I believe what God is doing and pointing to is he saying that if you begin to study my creation more closely, what you're going to, going to see is that my works are so great and so awesome and so marvelous beyond your understanding that it's possible that the work that I'm doing in your life is part of that. This thing, this work that I'm doing, that this affliction that you're you're, you're experiencing this pain that you're experiencing. In the end, if you trust, if you believe, even if you cannot see it, maybe you yourself will find out that you're part of this very good work. One of the things that I've been convicted of as I've been preaching through the book, or as we start our series in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, I'm taking my time working through it, and as you know, I've been attacking evolution, and I'm going to continue to do that. But I want to work through it a little bit more slowly than we might usually do. And the reason is, is that I, the, I, I'm, I'm very convicted, the more that I'm working through this, and the more studying that I'm doing, is that the church has lost its way on creation. There, th that the world has, has, has influenced us enough that too many of the people in the church... In the, in the churches themselves, we do not look at creation the same way we used to. If you go back even a couple hundred years, Christians would study just like the psalmist studied. They would study the, the flight of the hawk or the eagle or the sparrow or the wren. They would study all the aspects of creation, and they would directly credit God with that. Now, we live in a scientific age when there is so much knowledge and we're gaining so much understanding of the world, but... Ye, and, and, and we really are. I, I mean, that's not a lie. But we've disconnected that knowledge from the fact that it's God who has done all these things. And so I'm convinced that as we work through this, that we should take the time to, to kind of reorient ourselves and look at God's creation with the eye that he has done this. But the, the thing is, is that in, in, the book, in Genesis chapter 1, when... God is telling us his story of the creation. It's very bare bones. I don't know if you've noticed that, but it's very bare bones. 
So we've worked through day one and day two a little bit, and, and today I want to look at day three. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. That is a marvelous statement, and it was so. Now, you and I have probably read that text many times in our lives. Have you ever stopped to think about what's really happening when God speaks and what happens next? Has anyone just sat there and pictured, okay, well, what does that mean? When, when God said, and let all the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear, what did that look like? Have you done that? All right, well, let me, let me give you a, uh, let me give, me, give us a little bit of an illustration. On May, 19, on May 18 of 1980, a 5.1 earthquake struck directly underneath Mount St. Helens in Washington State, which triggered a volcanic eruption, which resulted in the largest known landslide in human knowledge. Okay, so there's, and when this happened, by the way, brothers and sisters, um, people were watching Mount St. Helens because everybody's watching it because they were expecting something to happen because there had been a lot of smaller earthquakes underneath it. There had been a lot of magma. And, and people were just kind of watching it. And so it was actually being studied at this moment. But anyway, so this, this earthquake underneath, a 5.1, which we don't think of as, as being that big, but it's directly underneath it. So there's a landslide. And what happens next, okay, the landslide starts taking all this dirt and rock off Mount St. Helens. And what's happening is right underneath that dirt is a huge bubble. Okay, the landslide exposed the dacite magma in St. Helens' neck. And so what it's saying is the, mag the magma, just a little bit lower on the mountain, um, has a lot lower pressure now, causing the gas-charged, partially molten rock and high-pressure steam above it to explode a few seconds after the landslide started. Explosions burst through the trailing part of the landslide, blasting rock and debris northward. The resulting blast directed the pyroclastic flow. Now, that's a strange term, but they'll explain it next. The pyroclastic flow laterally. That consisted of a very hot volcanic gases, ash and pumice, and they for formed from new lava as well as pulverized old rock. Okay, so what they're saying is, is that, so there's a landslide that's happening on top of the mountain. It's sliding down the mountain. But right behind it, just a little bit up the mountain, now that that rock and stone and all this, this weight is off, there's an explosion. This, the whole north side of the mountain just blows up and shoots out. Okay, this, this pyroclastic flow. Now you've got a whole different thing going on. That flow of that material um, was moving initially at about, 220 miles per hour, and the blast quickly accelerated to about 670 miles an hour. Okay, so what's happening is now all this magma, this volcano, this, this volcanic um, ash and magma, you know, it's superheated, it's over a thousand degrees, and there's all this stuff just blasting out of the side and blowing down this mountain. It begins at 220 miles and actually hits a speed of 670 miles an hour. The pyroclastic flow material passed over the moving avalanche. So remember that dirt that started out, it, it blew right over top of that. The pyroclastic flow material passed over the moving avalanche. It spread outward, devastating a, a fan-shaped area 23 miles across by 19 miles long. In total, about 230 square miles of forest was knocked down, and extreme heat killed trees miles beyond the blowdown zone. At its vent, the lateral blast probably did not last longer than about 30 seconds, but the northward uh, radiating and expanding blast cloud continued for about another minute. Okay, so the speed that we're talking about, this explosion, it's only lasting 30 seconds to a minute, but it's moving very fast. Superheated flow material flashed water in Spirit Lake and in North Fork River to steam, creating a, a larger secondary explosion that was heard as far away as British Columbia, Montana, Idaho, and Northern California. Later studies indicated that one-third of the .045 cubic miles of material in the flow was new lava, and the rest was fragmented older rock. Now, 
If you go online and you look at some of this, there's a lot of pictures, etc. Somebody took a picture from 35 miles away about 12 to 15 minutes after the blast. It happened at 8.30 in the morning. About 12 to 15 minutes later, somebody took a photo. And in that photo, there's a cloud. And that cloud was 40 miles wide. And it was 12 miles high. It was like the most horrific mushroom cloud you've ever seen in your life. All right. Now, I know there's some things in there you didn't understand, but you can kind of get the idea that there's an, an amazing amount of energy and power that's blasting out of the earth at this point. Magnify that picture by a few billion times, and you'll begin to understand what was happening in verse 9. Because this planet was completely blue, right? If you were st sitting in a in a little spaceship up above planet Earth, and you could look down, it was completely blue. It was a blue marble because it's completely covered with sea. It's all water. And God said, let all the waters under heaven be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And what that means is that starting at the point when God speaks that all the elements and all the things that are underneath the Earth, and brothers and sisters, there is magma, there is fire, there is... You can't even, I did a whole bunch of study on this stuff about what's underneath the earth and the forces that are underneath the earth. And what happened when God spoke is that literally the planet exploded. Because all this force and all this fire and all this lava and earthquake forces and energy forces that you cannot, infinite forces, just blew this land up through the water. But in verse 9, it just says, God said, and it was so. Mind-boggling. I did some study on the uh, power of earthquakes. The, uh, during, the during the 2004 Sumatra earthquake in, uh, in the Indian Ocean, measured 9.1 on the Richter scale, the energy released was equivalent to 550 million times the energy of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, Japan. A 9.0 earthquake releases enough energy in what they call the seismic moment that it could power, it would produce, if you could channel all that energy, it, it would produce enough power to, to energize all the homes and all the businesses in the, in, in the United States for almost 400 years in just one. So when God speaks and all the elements and all the fire and all the rock and stone underneath the earth pushes up because there was no land and all of a sudden we have, we have hundreds of millions of acres. 29% of the world's surface is covered with land now. There was no land above the waters. God spoke. This world literally exploded with fire and magma and God pushing and all this earth rose up above the waters. Before the ashes were even down, before the smoke was cleared, before the, before the thundering was done, God was already on to the next job. That's what blows me away. In day three, that's only one part of day three. That's the beginning of day three. Then he turns, right? And, and for me, for me it is astounding because if you think about the cataclysmic forces that were unleashed and then would be unleashed again later on in the flood, but the cataclysmic forces and the, the thundering, and, and for us it would have been just a, a scene of complete and total devastation, yet it's completely 100% directed and under the control and power of God. And even though to our eyes it would look like a total cataclysmic situation, because no, no life on earth could, be, could exist during something like that. But it's all controlled perfectly, and we see that because in the next thing that God does, we see almost a completely opposite action. Now it's like God takes an afternoon to, to, to just do some peaceful pursuits. Because the next thing that he does on day three is he creates the grasses, the herbs, and the fruit-bearing trees. Right? It says that, that God was done. He made it, the dry land earth. He gathering together the waters. He called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, 
and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And uh, just a, a few notes here, okay? First of all, the idea of um, after its kind. I'm going to talk about that more later on, not today, but in this series. That's a very important thing, after its kind. Because you're going to see it again and again, because it's going to talk about him making sea creatures and, and flying creatures uh, of the heavens, birds, etc. Then he's going to talk about making animals and insects, etc. And everything's going to be made after its kind. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that God made and created every variety that we find in the world today? No. Actually, it doesn't. Right? So how many dogs did he make, right? Because there is an almost infinite variety of dogs in the world today. Did God make and create, on, when he created dogs, did he create all those dogs? No. He only created a couple, I, we imagine. I mean, even the creation scientists just imagine that he made enough dogs, and then out of that, there's a variety that's possible. So when it says, after its kind, it's actually saying that something that's completely opposite of what the evolutionist says. The evolutionist has this great poetry in mind, right? They have this great poetry in mind. They talk about the tree of life. They love that phrase, the tree of life, because they've grabbed it from us and, and taken it for themselves. But theirs is ignorant, right? Because what they're saying is that after billions of years on earth, that something combined and some tiny living microbe came to life. And out of that tiny living microbe that was microscopic, you couldn't even see it, over hundreds of millions of years, it developed into this, and then it developed into this. And everything of life develops out of that one thing. So there's just one tree of life, and everything develops from that one tree of life. But that's not the story that God tells. The story that God tells is on that when he's creating, he's creating families of kinds. So grasses after their kinds, and herbs after their kinds, and fruit trees, or, or, or fruit-bearing trees after their kinds. Each one of them is being created after its kind. And so what we think, just like when you look at human beings, for, ex for example, right? We believe that God only created Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve were a certain um, skin color, and they had a certain hair color, and they had a certain eye color, right? But out of them come all the varieties of humans that we see. Right? We have very pale humans. We have very dark humans. We have very tall humans. We have very short humans. Right? We have humans of, that have all different eye colors. And so what it is is that in the genetic code that God creates of each kind, he creates enough, um, there's a range or a variety that can come out of them. So when he creates the rose, he doesn't create 400 varieties of rose. But all of those varieties are actually inside the original rose. Okay, so enough about that. But let's just think for a few minutes here about what God is doing when he creates all these grasses. Because it is stupendous. Every one of these areas, brothers and sisters of science, is an area of particular study. And, and one of the things that God is doing when he's creating all these grasses and he's creating these herbs, etc., he's making them for nutrition. Right? Because he's, he's preparing the dry land. He's preparing, preparing food for the ones that he's, the living creatures that he's about to make. So the first thing that he's probably looking at is nutrition. Right? So all the animals are going to need to have nutrition. They're going to need to eat these grasses. But also man, and, and we're going we're gonna to eat herbs and vegetables. We're going to need, our bodies are going to need a certain amount of nutrition. So everything that God creates on day three He's creating with an idea that this is also going to be food. So he, he makes this, this huge variety, this great variety of different types of, of fruits and herbs and vegetables, all on this, on, on this third day. But also consider the fact that God is also working on the biosphere, right? He knows things that we don't know. When he's creating these, these plants, he's not just creating them for nutrition. He's not just creating them for food. He's also creating them in a way that they can take the bad stuff that we expel, right? Because when humans, in fact, all animals, when we breathe, we breathe in oxygen, and then we breathe out one of the waste products is CO2, carbon dioxide, so carbon di too much carbon dioxide is not good in our biosphere for life. 
So God creates these plants, and while he's doing it, he creates this thing called photosynthesis, which is this marvelous engineering thing where God takes these green plants, and they gather sunlight, and they, and they take in the CO2, and then these green plants emit, they emit oxygen. And so that's a second thing that he's doing, right? So he's creating all these green plants with the idea that they're going to actually make the biosphere more livable. But there's a third thing, and, and there might be more too, brothers and sisters, but the, the third thing is, is just he's also creating them. He's creating them to be seen. He's creating them with an eye for beauty. That every one of these plants is going to have its own unique individual shape. And I just think of, of like the flowers, right? Because flowers to me are just so amazing because they show so much design and architecture. Design and architecture in the, in the very shape of, of the petals and the shape of the flower. And then also in the design of the flower overall. But then there's a whole separate field of design when it comes to color, right? And how the colors work in the... And God's doing all of this on day three. He's calling all these things forth for nutrition and, and for looks and, and for, the, for the whole biosphere. Now, there's one final thing I want to talk about plants before I end. One of the great wonders of the world is seed dispersal. Now, I don't know, some of you probably study this, know a little bit about this. But there's a whole branch of science that studies plants and their seed dispersal. The idea being that all living plants need and compete for sunlight and for water. So if a plant has seed and the seed just drops beneath the plant, right, the mother plant is going to have all the sunlight. The mother plant is going to have first dibs on all the water. So if that seed is going to actually germinate and grow, it's got to get to a place where it can have its own little piece of real estate, its own piece of sunlight, and its own ability to get water. Okay, so God designed on day three all these things of, of dispersing seed. And I'm just going to give us a few examples because there's many more. But there are flowers where the seeds are so tightly packed in pods. And, and so what it is, if you look at the pod, if you look at it, it's like a, think of like a pea pod. And then on the bottom of that pea pod, these, these little seeds are all lined up just like peas, but they're crammed in there really tight. But what happens is at a certain point when the pod starts to dry out, the pod starts to contract down there at the spine, which is pulling these seeds closer and tighter and tighter together. And so at a certain point, and they do this on time-lapse photography, at a certain point, you'll just see these things under pressure start to ping, and they just start shooting out. They just start shooting out, and they shoot out for yards to get away from the mother plant so they can get their own sunlight and their own water. There's a squirting cucumber where the seeds are in a fluid, again, inside some, some kind of a pod. There's fluid in there with the seed. And again, the same thing happens. The pod starts to dry up, and there's all this fluid inside there, and you can't, uh, well, fluids don't, don't, uh, don't compress well, Right? So what happens is that, that pressure starts to grow inside of there, and the pressure gets so great that at some point, even just a tiny raindrop hitting that pod will open the top of the pod, and this thing starts to squirt. It just starts to squirt out, and they squirt for yards. These, these seeds just squirt right out of there. Okay? So think about also the, the milkweeds, milkweed plant. That seed is attached to a piece of fluff, and that fluff is designed in such a way Brothers and sisters, they've actually been able to track this stuff. You know, see, you, you guys are paying taxes and stuff, I imagine. But somebody studied it. I mean, milkweed fluff can go up to 400 miles. It's mind-blowing, right? Think about the maple tree and those little seed helicopters. Those were designed by God with the idea that when the wind would blow at a certain point, that the seeds would actually, the, the wind would blow and these things would break free and then this helicopter action would keep them in the air long enough to get them away from the tree so that they could have their own sunlight and their own water. My last example is the dandelion. 
And I chose the dandelion because it's such a simple, a simple plant that we just don't think much of. In fact, most of us think it's kind of irritating. But as the dandelion flower dies, it's replaced with seeds which are each attached to a fluffy top which is called the pappus. And the pappus is an intricate structure designed for flight. Scientists used a very small wind tunnel to study how air flowed through and around the pappus. So the pappus is just like these little tiny tendrils, like little tiny threads. But the whole thing is designed very carefully because what they found is that as the air moves around this little pappus, that there was a vortex never before seen in, in nature. As the air moved around the parachute-like top of the dandelion seed, the, com the complex interaction of air currents um, formed this vortex, and that swirl of air created a low pressure area, and, and I won't go into all this, but if there's low pressure, if something's flying through the air and there's lower pressure above than below, the thing that's flying will tend to go up, okay? So the idea being is that this simple little thing that we remember as kids picking dandelions and blowing it, those little tendrils have been very carefully designed and engineered to blow on the wind and get away to where they can have their own water and their own sunlight. Well, and sisters, when I study the wonders of God's creation, I feel like a hungry person walking into Costco. Because you go into Costco, you need to get some food, you're hungry, and that's a bad time to go to Costco because you start buying everything, you get home, you can't eat none of it, right? Or very little bit of it. But the point being is, is that there's so many varieties and there's so much. The same thing is true when you start to study creation. There is so much to see. And, and, and what you find is that all these areas, whether it's the earth sciences, geology, what's underneath the earth, or whether it comes to plants, and herbs, and vegetables, and fruits, etc. When you begin seed dispersal, all these things, each one of them, each one of them, there's, there's brilliant conceptions, engineering, design, and it's all there. And you, you really were overwhelmed with it. But God did it all. One of the things that I've been praying a lot about when I'm working through this, working through this series, because I am convinced that we have to focus on creation more than we do but one of the things I, I pray about is how do you apply these things and as I was studying this text and, and praying about application God put this this text on my heart in, in Luke chapter 5 verses 1 through 11 we read about Jesus um, and he comes down to the shore Lake of Galilee Sea of Galilee his disciples are just coming in they've been out there all night fishing haven't gotten anything and they come in and they're, and they're drying their nets or they're, they're, they're folding their nets and, and obviously getting ready to put everything away so they go home and go to bed. Jesus, the taskmaster, says, uh, no, put me out on this boat here. So they get out on a boat, get away from the shore a little bit, and he begins to preach to the people on the, on, on, on the land. And then he says this. Uh, he says to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered him and said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. I remember, I, I preached on this about seven, eight years ago, and I remember reading a commentator, and I did not appreciate it at the time, but it just clicked for me this week. And I don't know, I don't remember who, who the man's name is so that I cannot give him proper credit. But he said it was as if the creator spoke a word in his mind that only the fish could hear. And he said, come. And all the fish in the Sea of Galilee began to race toward that boat. And they were leaping into the nets, trying to get into the nets because the Creator had said, come. And I think to myself, when we look at the creation and we think about how God speaks, and it says, and it was so, that when our Creator and our Savior says to us, come, should we not listen? 
If the magma underneath the earth hears his words and they explode out of the earth, out of the waters to become the dry land. If God speaks to the soil and begins to create and bring forth and, and each plant is, is designed perfectly according to his word. If God speaks and all things that are come forth, is he not telling us when I speak and I say, come, follow me, that you should listen and that we should come and believe and trust in the one who created us, designed us, built us, and redeems us. Amen.